narrow them down to at least the classes. And, and if you're not quite sure what that means, uh, I am going to address that today. So arthropod classes. So let's get into our slides here. Okay, so up to this point, you should know all of your arthropod characteristics, molting, um, the idea that they are diverse, very adaptable, um, the difference between chelicerates and mandibulates. Uh, so all that is, is knowledge that you should have. Now, as we progress, uh, kind of uh, showing you a very primitive uh, species, we call these the horseshoe crabs, limulus. Uh, they show the characteristics of the jointed appendages, right? That's why we, we call them arthropods, jointed legs. Uh, they are chelicerates. And I hope you have had the chance to observe some of these uh, specimens, if that's what you chose to do, some ethology, uh, being able to see how the little mouth parts, the chelicerate feed. Um, and, and just again, it, it's, it's neat to watch. Uh, but now I want to get into the different classes, and I'm going to go kind of fast through these just to address them. I'm not going to get in a lot of depth. Um, again, th this could be a whole semester, a whole course just on each of these classes. But uh, we begin with the crustacea, one of the more primitive forms of arthropods, one of the, I guess, older types of arthropods. Uh, possibly some of the precursors to the rest of the arthropods, they still evolved and maintained their, their survival within the aquatic environments. And there's a few of them that have moved up onto land, but most of them tend to, to still stay in the oceanic and, and sort of uh, aquatic habitats. So you know these as lobsters, crabs, crayfish, shrimp, um, the roly polies, right? those are actually categories of crustaceans as well. So how do we distinguish these? Well, they're going to have mandibles. So they are mandibulates. Uh, they're going to have two antennae. We call this biramus antennae, two like a, a main and then a sub branch off the antenna. Uh, they do have a lot of economic importance. Right here in El Paso, if we go to Red Lobster, you know, man, we're going to pay some, some bucks to get uh, you know, lobster dinner. Uh, crabs are, are have to be imported here. They are utilized as a food source. Crayfish, maybe not so much here, but you go to Louisiana, very popular as a food source. Shrimp. So again, a lot of economy based off of uh, crustaceans as a food source. Uh, they have, again, the modified sort of uh, legs, kilipeds, the claws. They have, again, their modified abdomen for swimming. And they have the fused cephalothorax. So they have a fused head and a thorax together. So it's not flexible. Uh, they don't have that mode of, uh, again, of flexibility there. So it's one unit and one unit here, the abdomen and the cephalothorax. So characteristics of our crustaceans. And just showing you some crabs, some shrimp. Um, Kind of a different uh, branch phylogenetically, still an arthropod, but very, very distinct from the crustaceans we call the arachnids. So these are more abundant, very common in the deserts. And I, I suspect you may have found some of these already if you went out flipping rocks and boards and stuff around your home. So the arachnids are the chelicerates that include things like our scorpions, spiders, ticks, uh, sulpugids, which we call camel spiders. Uh, vinegaroons, pseudoscorpions, and mites. So these are characterized by no antenna. They don't have any of the dominant antennae. Uh, they have four pairs of legs. They can have additional sort of uh, feeding structures, but they have four walking legs, or I should say four pairs of walking legs. Medically and economically important. So there are some very toxic species, very venomous forms. And if you have a lot of ticks in your yard, you have a lot of scorpions in your yard, you typically call the exterminators, right? So that's going to cost money as well. So economically significant, medically significant forms as well. So again, scorpions, most of you, I think, know what scorpions are. Um, again, I, I think they're really fascinating little animals. No antennae, but they are covered in these little sensory hairs. Trichobothria, the little, little sensory hairs 
that extend outside of the arth or the arthropods exoskeleton, the exoskeleton of these uh, of, of these forms. Um, the little sort of venom glands in the back of the telson and the little stinger. So the the pedipalps, the, the, the claws basically are not considered walking legs. So they will have their eight legs. In addition, then they have the two uh, one pair, two of the pedipalps, and then they also have the chelicerae that are going to help in, in the feeding process. So they will have chelicerae, the pedipalps, and then one underneath there, two, three, four pairs of walking legs. So one, two, three, and the fourth one is not visible, and then the pedipalps, and then the chelicerae there. Um, it's a little bit too early right now in, in, in May, but give it a couple of weeks, months, uh, and you should start to see these. If you find these out in the wild, you flip a, a rock and it may shock you to see uh, all of the, the babies piled up on the, on the backs of moms. Right? And, and they have a really neat um, gestational kind of behavior. So they have live birth like, like humans. Uh, they will carry the babies for up to seven months depends on the species, they give birth live, uh, a lot of maternal behavior, the mom takes care of the babies until they molt that first time, they get that hard exoskeleton, and then they will disperse away from mom. But uh, again, it may surprise you, right, that they do make good mothers. These scorpions are, are very maternal. Kind of like a scorpion, but missing the tail. We call these pseudoscorpions, and these are tiny. They're, they're millimeters in size. I, I'll be very impressed if you find some of these. Um, and they do have venom, but the venom is in that swollen gland here on the pedipalps there, so on the claws. So again, just tiny, tiny little things. You find them on flowers. Um, they're around. They're in the desert, in the soil, in the ground, uh, but again, very, very difficult to see. Uh, the infamous camel spiders. There's so many sort of exaggerations on these little these little organisms. They are not venomous. They are common out here in the desert. Um, to me, they are little just ADHD little little creatures, right? They'll be running around all crazy. They stop, right? They'll be running around all crazy. Uh, they're nocturnal. You'll find these around your porch if you have a porch light on at night. These are the maiden predators of all these little flying insects. Um, they're scary looking, but they don't, they don't have any venom. Spiders, on the other hand, all species will have venom. It depends on the species as to how potent that venom is. Uh, but again, you, you have just a multitude of spider species, uh, from tarantulas to little garden spiders, orb spiders, again, so many different types. And, and they're all different but similar in the idea that uh, they, they have the same anatomical structures. They are, uh, they use uh, webs in a, in a very similar way. So going back to the body plan, right? They do have a large abdomen and they also have that sort of head thorax kind of fused together. So they don't have those three body segments, only two the open circulatory system that we've covered before, chelicerae modified as uh, venom injecting mechanisms, and depends on the species, uh, we can have sort of variations on the eye structures. So most spiders, if not all, will produce silk. And, and again, silk can be used for multiple reasons, for, for capturing prey, for making uh, sort of cocoons to, to lay eggs, to put on their burrows, to trap moisture, to maintain humidity. So again, depends on the species, but silk is highly associated with this group, the arachnids, the spiders. But there's the spider that has made his uh, web or her web and, and basically is just waiting for a little bug to fly in there. Uh, Daddy long legs, what we call opilionis. Uh, these are related to the arachnids, but are they're they're different in the sense 
They don't have the, the two body segments. They basically have one sort of body segment fused together. So abdomen and cephalothorax kind of in, in one unit. Uh, the four legs, again, they are spiders. They are venomous, but they're, their venom is so, or I should say their, their, their chelicerae are so tiny that they can't really harm humans. So they, they, we consider them harmless to us. Ticks and mites, if you have pets that live outdoors, you may have to deal with these during the summer. So ticks are ectoparasites. They will attach on the host. They suck blood. And again, it, it, they can transmit disease. Uh, they itch, they hurt. They're not something that you want stuck on you. Um, so again, we consider them medically important and economically important as well. If you ever analyze these on your pets, you will see sort of two forms, these little tiny ones and then these big ones. These big ones are basically the female. So the female is going to be the one that has to have enough nutrition to, to sort of lay the eggs. So the males are going to be more adapted for moving. So the female finds a, a good feeding area, releases pheromones, and the, the mobile males will be the ones traveling to the female. We see that a lot with arthropods. Uh, with tarantulas, backtracking a little bit, uh, you will see tarantulas often crawling in the desert, crossing roads. Um, again, usually it's the males. The males will be moving, trying to reach the female that is more stationary, larger, uh, bigger bodies, we call these like big mamas. They're not going to be very mobile, but the males are going to come to the females. And I want to do, I do want to mention, I want to kind of get into a little bit more detail, uh, do these a little bit more justice to locally venomous spiders that basically you just should know about. Uh, they, they do pose a risk uh, and, and can really mess up your day for sure. So these are two species of spiders. We call these the black widow spider and the brown recluse. So both very common here in El Paso. Um, black widows, because they're black, they have a very characteristic red hourglass on the ventral, on the belly side. The brown recluse typically has a little violin pattern on the back. We call these sometimes fiddle back spiders. You got to use your imagination. You got to be up close also to see to see this. The saccharid, the uh, the the brown recluse eye pattern is also very unique. Uh, it's very primitive, different than almost every other spider. But again, you have to see these under close magnification, and many people don't get that close to them. They'll see a brown spider and, and squash it normally. And and it's always interesting. A lot of you students tell me, no, I, I have reservations. I feel bad killing bugs for the project, but when you see these uh, fly, a cockroach, or a spider, most of you very, very quickly will, will, will destroy this species, so this, this individual. So just again, little thought on that there, but coming back here, there's our brown recluse, right? There's our four pairs of legs, a large abdomen, that little fiddleback. So again, they, Comparing these two to each other is very easy to tell them apart. Black widow, not many other species look like black widows around here. Brown recluse, a lot of species look like brown recluse. Uh, but when, when we get into their venom composition, it's very, very different. So black widows, we consider to be very neurotoxic. Their venom is designed to uh, to block neurotransmitters, basically paralyzing the, the muscles, paralyzing the diaphragm, making it very difficult for the brain to send signals to the different parts of the body. So neurotoxic, uh, attacking the nervous system. Brown recluse, very different. Brown recluse doesn't really target the nerves. It targets uh, blood cells. It targets blood vessels. It targets uh, muscles, so we call it a very, very hemorrhagic or myotoxic type of venom. It's just very destructive. It makes a mess of the tissue. Right? So uh, what it's trying to do is trying to digest the meal before it consumes the meal. And, and, and again, it, you don't want to get bit by these. It, it is a serious type of uh, complication that will arise afterwards. So again, 
dangerous spiders, but dangerous in very, very different ways. So this is an example of a brown recluse envenomation. So I stole these off of the Tucson Poison Control Center page. I don't have all the details, all the information, but this is what I could uh, determine. So um, this is three days after the bite. As you can see there on the left thumb, uh, we start to see some discoloration. So this person probably got bit, waited for a while, probably tried to treat it at home for a few days. And then by day three, like, nope, this is hurting. It's not getting better. I'm gonna go and get this checked. And that's very typical of, of how these cases progress. So day four, we can see again that bruising spreading and getting darker. And if, if we understand what this means, all that bruising is telling us that we have tissue destruction underneath the surface here. So again, uh, not very pleasant there. Day six, you can see the necrosis. So the, the tissue is starting to die. If we're destroying blood cells, we're destroying blood vessels, we're destroying muscle, there's no way to get new oxygenated blood to the area. There's no way to get nutrition to the area. So all of this tissue starts to starve, starts to be deprived of oxygen, and starts to die. So that, that's what the venom is trying to accomplish. Right? And then it's like a chain reaction. As more area dies, uh, becomes necrotic, we can start to spread infection internally. And as, as more blood vessels become damaged, less oxygen, less oxygenated uh, blood coming to the area, more blood seeping out. And, and it just it, it's just a wicked type of envenomation process there. So we notice here now day nine. So basically that's what's been happening underneath. We just haven't been seeing that. Now with the top layer of skin removed because all the underneath tissue has died, uh, we see the necrosis, the black dead tissue. Uh, we can start to see skeletal components. Uh, and again, that right there is what a brown recluse venom bite looks like, right? It's severe, not all of them get this bad, but they do have the potential to be uh, pretty harsh. So day 10, and again, this is the last day of information I could find. I don't think, I would guess the person didn't lose the finger, uh, but I would suspect a lot of medical expense a lot of very painful grafts that had to be done in order to uh, to seal that up, right? So again, when we, when we talk about medically significant spiders, understand that brown recluse is here. Um, I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to go kill every little brown spider that you see. Just be aware, right? Be aware that they are around. They were here first. El Paso built their city, built our city on top of the original desert that was here, the original habitat for a lot of these spiders. Right? So very, very different type of um, effect. With a black widow, you would see none of this, right? You would just two little, two little bite, uh, you know, wounds there, two little dots where you got envenomated, not a lot of swelling, not much, but you would have respiratory distress, you couldn't breathe, uh, and it could be fatal potentially like for an elderly person, for a young child. Um, but, but again, it's a very, very different outcome of neurotoxic venom versus hemorrhagic or myotoxic venom. All right, so jumping from the spiders, the arachnids, we go to the myriapods. So myriapods, there are two categories. We're going to call these the, uh, the centipedes. Centipedes are very fast, venomous predators. Millipedes, very slow moving, um, basically herbivores, right? They, they can be poisonous, but you have to actually eat them, ingest them to be harmed. Uh, they, they're not gonna bite, they're not gonna sting. Um, centipedes, we call chylopoda, and millipedes, diplopoda. And what that refers to basically is how many legs are coming off of each body segment. For centipedes, um, that doesn't actually translate to 100 legs. They're not, they don't have 100 legs. They typically have around 20, about 23, 24. So we have one, one pair of legs coming off of each body segment, each of these somites. 
the the millipedes will have two pairs of legs coming off of each segment. So diplopoda, two pairs of legs. And that's sort of the, the, the nomenclature that we use for these myriapods. So millipedes, you can see here, two legs per segment, two legs per segment, two legs per segment, two legs per segment, two tiny legs per segment. This is kind of like the form we have around here. Ours are more uh, dark brown. Some of them can be this yellow and, and black, but they're going to have this sort of body form, like more elongated. Uh, scorp uh, uh, centipedes, we have like two, maybe three large species here. Uh, the, the, the sting hurts. I mean, if you were to get stung, it does hurt. Uh, they, they do have needle sharp spines on the end of each leg, but they're not venomous here. The venom only comes from uh, the underneath their, their head region. They have um, two legs that are modified to inject venom. So basically when a centipede bites you, it doesn't necessarily bite you. It's not using a mouth part, it's, it's using legs. So it's basically hugging you, right? It's hugging you and injecting uh, venom with those little modified arms. Uh, again, they can get quite large. I don't recommend handling these large ones. Uh, again, this thing hurts a lot and it takes a long time to heal. So it's, it's not a pleasant thing. Okay, so um, we've covered then our crustaceans, we've covered our arachnids and myriapods. So up to this point, again, there's our centipedes, our spiders, uh, crustaceans. Well, at this point in the evolutionary process, something happened, something big happened where we had some sort of a major mutation, some sort of selection, uh, drift, uh, some, some evolutionary factor occurred where there was a major change in protein structure. So what, what happened at this point was that the leg number started to be reduced. So we went from a lot of legs to fewer legs, a change in the, in the body plan as well of the, of the arthropod. So this is the precursor then to our modern insects mosquitoes, flies, butterflies, moths, beetles. So if at this point, right, if we can kind of look at the evolutionary progression, we have the colonization of land, right? Crustaceans in the water, uh, now arachnids kind of radiating throughout the, the land. Myriapods, we have this amazing predator, the centipede. And if we have a mutation in which leg numbers reduce, what does that do to speed? Right. Well, well, this six-legged animal is going to be much slower than this multi-legged animal. So, uh, speed is still present. I mean, it's still fast with six legs, but not as fast as some of the others. There, right? So, uh, a new modification had to start to evolve and be selected for at this point. So, and that's going to be a major evolutionary success that we call flight. Right. So. If you can outrun your predators, but if you can fly, <clears throat> that gives you a, a tremendous sort of uh, survival um, sort of uh, chance, right? You, you can outfly, uh, not outrun, you can fly, outfly your, your predators. You can leave bad environments. You can find good environments very easily. You can cross mountains easy. You can cross rivers easy. So flight really helped them radiate and expand and, and, and get into all kinds of major habitats. And again, that's the, the basis for our insects, class insecta. So they are the most diverse and adaptable groups of arthropods. Uh, they do have the ability to fly, most of them. There's some modifications. The worker ants cannot, worker termites cannot. Uh, but most beetles can fly. The, the drones, the queens can, can swarm for some of these, you know, flies and termites. Um, they've been able to go into all terrestrial, all, all aquatic habitats. They have three pairs of legs, three distinct body segments, and one pair of antenna. And very, very obvious mandibles there, right? So the, as collectively as a group, they are economically important. They're medically important. They're just 
They've radiated to, to so many different habitats. They've evolved into so many body forms. Uh, just very, very impressive. Um, so there's the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So three body segments, six legs, pair of antenna, compound eyes, uh, spiracles used for respiration as opposed to some of the book lungs that we see with the arachnids. Again, depending on what you have evolved to do, it has modified the the forms of these arthropods. If, if you're an arthropod that is evolved to suck blood, you have a basically a hypodermic needle. If you're a uh, arthropod that is evolved to lick nectar from flowers, well, you have this very elongated tongue, right? Flies, they just, again, they've evolved for different niches and their body plants are just super diverse. Again, there's our body plans, body forms. Again, just a different way of breathing, right? Spiracles, they basically have little holes on, along the sides. If you observe some of the behavior of these grasshoppers or these crickets when they breathe, it goes down to the, the, the laws of physics, right? They have to expand their abdomen and recoil, right? They, they're moving air in and out of their trachea. So we have a similar trachea, but ours is in our throat, right? They don't breathe from the mouth, nose, throat, down to the lungs, right? They breathe basically from the sides of their body in, sides of their body in. So it's a very, very different, well, it's just not say different. It's the same basic anatomy just coming into a very different part of the body, right? Now, when we get into arthropods, uh, specifically insects, I want you to notice this term here, P-T-E-R-A. So coleoptera, diptera, lepidoptera, hymenoptera. So we get into now types of orders, right? So it's um, phylum arthropoda, class insecta, now order coleoptera for the beetles or diptera for the flies, or lepidoptera for the butterflies, hymenoptera for the bees, wasps, and ants. So these teras are gonna then give you an idea of what taxonomical order that we find these insects are. So the true bugs, um, grasshoppers, crickets, and roaches, uh, orthoptera, dragonflies, odonata. It's a little bit different uh, name, but it's still an order. Isoptera, the termites, Siphonoptera, the fleas. And it just, again, it goes on and on. There's, there's many more types of orders of insects, but these are some of the most common that you'll kind of uh, uh, find out when you're searching for these things. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of artistic, uh, you know, flair that you have, what kind of collection that, that you were able to acquire. Um, see what kind of pinning that, that you've done for your lab projects there, but moths, butterflies are pretty common around this time of year, pretty uh, um, sort of easy to catch with a little net. Um, they're harmless to humans. They start out as caterpillars, they metamorphose out into the adult butterflies there. Mosquitoes also common depending on what part of town you live, but for those of you that, that have a problem killing insects, I've never known anybody that had a problem killing mosquitoes, right? So they are blood suckers, very effective ectoparasites, but also transmitters of many diseases throughout the world, right? So from malaria, dengue fever, um, West Nile virus, they can carry a plethora of different types of, of, of protozoan or bacterial parasites as well. Uh, the ladybugs, which are actually very voracious predators, right? They eat aphids, which are plant parasites, um, agricultural pests and remedies, uh, very common in agricultural fields. And kind of coming back to my interest, my sort of the field that I really focus on most, which is the toxicology. So uh, insects have all kinds of cool venoms and strategies and behaviors. Uh, most of you are familiar with uh, sort of yellow jackets and bees and wasps. Maybe most of you have been stung by these at some point, ants. 
these bombardier beetles are quite interesting. Um, they're just, again, mother nature, the evolutionary process has generated these organisms with uh, these natural little biochemical factories, right? They have all different types of, of venoms. We see the venoms in, in arachnids, but they've just evolved a little bit more with the insects, right? So different strategies, uh, very, very toxic forms, some species, some not so much. Um, but again, just, and I, as I mentioned, I, I know I'm not doing this group complete justice, uh, but I do want to kind of show you the, the variety of different types of arthropod classes there, right? So with that, uh, I'll call it a 